sound of this guitar makes me want to know a little more about the instrument. It also makes me want to know more about the musician playing it. You're listening to Music Student 101. Today's guest, guitarist Carlos Pino. And now your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. Okay, today is a very today special, is special. Today is special. It's yes, another it special is. episode. Uh, Matt, do you remember last episode? We kind of had a little fun talking about that podcast, S Town. Yes, I do. And how Birmingham, this is kind of our little M town, music town. <laughs> we know so many people. You're going to still have to know all these characters. Um, all these people <laughs> are going to start. We have some, re, you know, um, reestablishing of some characters here. Uh, today we have Carlos Pino. Yay! Yay! And Carlos is going to talk to us about the guitar. Okay. Sure. Welcome, Carlos. Hello. Uh, Carlos, your little brother, Oscar, was in my fourth grade class. Wow. This is how interweave. Yeah, uh, St. Rose. This is how oh, interweave. Rose, yes. This town is here. Mm-hmm. And then here I meet you so many years later at UAB. Yes. The University of Alabama at Birmingham, was, which is where myself and Matt um, got our BAs. And I did too. And yes. you did as well. Yeah. And I think you maybe were a little bit ahead of us. I think you're doing a lot maybe of. Maybe a couple of years, uh, but I took some time off, so I think I've probably finished with you guys. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what was your main focus of study? Because I thought I remember seeing you with the jazz ensemble. I actually was a music tech. Uh, major. I was a double minor. Hmm. If there's such a thing. I was there was Spani- back then. <laughs> Spanish and history, and then, and then, yeah. I but I took all the courses. Courses what was available then. It's it's changed a lot since I went there. Hmm. I think I was in the second year of the program. Okay. And then you went on to the University of Alabama. And I took some courses because they, at that time they didn't offer jazz, and I was getting into jazz guitar. So they, uh, at that time, they would let me uh, take classes at Tuscaloosa. And so I took guitar, and then my teacher's an amazing arranger, so I took arranging as well out oh. there. So, so, And then I went off to Rutgers and got a master's back in the early 2000s oh. in, in jazz studies. Okay. Yeah. We were at one point trying to decide if we should have like an episode on jazz guitar, an episode on classical guitar, an yeah. episode on rock guitar, but I think we're just going to try for now to encompass the guitar itself. Yeah, I can do a little bit of all of those, so <laughs> hopefully I can help out. Good. Well, like that intro music was very pretty, not, not, not very... Um, not very jazzy. Not no. very jazzy. Tell me about that. Yeah, I was like uh, living in New Jersey, and you know, back when, before you had your iPhone, you'd have your mini disc recorders, and sometimes I would just... I was just whistling a tune, and I just I played some chords in a fit, and then I just arranged it. And it was one of those tunes that it just came around in like 10 minutes. Mm. And so it has a little weird time signature change, and I haven't quite figured out what it is yet. But, uh, <laughs> but it just one of those things, like it just comes around, you know? And uh, yeah, so that's how that happened. Literally, I was just sitting in my apartment just whistling a tune, and I just put some chords to it. And that's called country tune. Country tune, because in New Jersey, in Jersey City, that was kind of country sounding for up there. So I called it <laughs> country nice. tune. Yeah. It was and way back old. It was like from 2000, 2000. Well, I think it sounded great. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Very nice. Yeah. And that was you and a friend? It's at Brandon Peoples on bass. And we did a little CD of maybe six, seven years ago. And he's actually playing ukulele, kind of like a mandolin player would, you know, do the chunk that give you that that attack like a drum would mm. that you hear in the background that's him okay. doubling on a ukulele so it's brandon two of brandon's in one me okay okay yeah. two and then then i'm playing slide and singing a little bit and there's a band name in there somewhere <laughs> yes <Yeah. laughs> two brandon's and a carlos <laughs> <laughs> um that's very cool man brandon uh he's he's actually stood in for me for tonal vision a long time ago Oh, really? And he just busted. He, he, they gave him the charts, and he just knocked it right out. Oh, yeah, he's great. He and, you know, he teaches over at UAB also. Oh. Um, very versatile, you know, plays theater, does rock and roll, does church, does all types, types of things. Yeah. Working musician. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Versatility is a great advantage in this line of work, mm-hmm. as and we have ha- discussed before. right? Mm-hmm. And you have to be versatile. and um, But you have to be really good at one thing first. Mm. And try to, instead of I'm kind of a jack of all trades, but at least I'm good at one thing, and then I kind of branched out. But, right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, once you understand one thing really well, it can be easier to transmute that knowledge to... I think so. You know, to other things. Yes. Yeah, I've had to learn, because I do theater shows, I've had to learn how to play mandolin. I played violin in high school until my violin was stolen, but I used to play violin... And so learning the mandolin, it's just it's like a guitar meets a mandolin, and uh, right. or a banjo or ukulele yeah. or whatever. Yeah, any of those things versatile. tuned in fits. Yeah. Yes, once you learn guitar, then I can translate it somehow to these other stringed instruments. So, hmm. yeah. One one of my favorite things that I ever saw you do in theater was when you performed Hedvig and the Angry Inch. Yes. And you. You were playing guitar. You were playing keyboards. I forget my you, my Bulgarian name or whatever the <laughs> name was that Vig or Sick or had these weird names and uh, Vic or, and yeah, I played keys in that show and then guitar. And you sang also. And I sang, which is a rare thing to see. But uh, versatility is also can keep you pretty busy in a small market like this. Yes. Right? Yes. I play bass. I grew up in college. You know, there was no bass player. Hmm. Or one that read, so I played in the big band, I played jazz bass. Okay. And so that, I still, no one calls me for that. But it's it's good as a teacher to be able to teach it, and I, every once in a while I'll go out and play bass. Hmm. Yeah. It can be fun. Yeah. Matt, I think we've mentioned at some point that uh, you and I are both bass players. We, yeah, I think that's come up once or twice. Maybe about a hundred times, maybe? Yeah, it's, it's come up every episode, <laughs> is, the, is, is the joke. It's our ongoing joke. Um, <laughs> we'll let you in on that. Okay. Um, okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and get into it. Speaking of being okay. a working musician. Okay. Kind of tell us about um, where you are now and some of your accomplishments and some of your influences. Uh, I'll tell you what question. I'm doing. Okay, accomplishments. Well, I guess other than finishing college. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a huge accomplishment. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in getting a master's, that really helped me in the sense of um, it helped me as a player. So, it, But it opens doors for you for, for working. And as a teacher, I think just having that on your resume just open the door, people just call me because they need a guitarist of a certain amount of talent, but because I have that that degree, it's open doors. So it's open doors in for teaching in colleges. Um, and just people just, it's, you know, it's like, uh, it's been very helpful for me to be able to go when I go overseas and teach. My family's from Columbia, and through a long story, I, I go down there and do clinics uh, with bands, different types of bands. And it's just helpful to have that experience, the knowledge on the instrument um, in order to teach. So that because of that, I was able to go and, like I just said, teach to people in different countries, um, well, a different country, mm -hmm. and in different cities, different ages, and teach just music and teach guitar. And So that, I think that's the biggest thing I can say, and that's an ongoing thing I've been doing for over 10 years. Mm. Um, what an experience. Oh, yeah, because it's great. You know, the, one of the first times I did it, I went with the University of Alabama, actually, mm -hmm. through this thing called the Centro Colombo Americano. And it's like a, a, a foundation that it's an English school, but they have a cultural dynamic where they set up an inter, uh, interchange of cultures, American culture. So you meet, get to meet a lot of people. They learn about your music, or you could be an artist, or you could be a bluegrass music. So just something American. Hmm. From uh, and uh, Star Wars, mm -hmm. all sorts of things, and but then you get to meet a lot of people, and you get to show them because they they're very really talented people down there, especially on guitar. But you know, like blues, like people take it for granted here that blues is like in everything, but down there they they're hard rockers and they're into the like you know Columbia music, but they don't really do blues so well. So if you can show them that, they really appreciate it, and that's a lot of fun. You you can see people progress. So. As far as playing, just um, getting to do a lot of musicals, um, um, you know, I think, uh, I've, I think I've gotten more done as far as teaching, mm -hmm. um, but I, every once in a while I get to do some big shows, and that's kind of cool. So, influences. Who influenced you to become a musician or to become a guitar well, player? I, I, you know, I don't know about you guys, my mom plays guitar, my parents wow. used to host a lot of parties, and so they always... She would play, or someone else would play, and they would uh, uh, host a lot of parties. And so there would be a lot of dancing. So there's always music going on. Yeah, wow. And, uh, but just the most directly, there was always guitars in my house. And there was a piano. And, um, and I think they just appreciated that. So it was just around. I remember just staring at it, and I didn't know how it worked. 
<laughs> you know, and I'd pick it up. And then I think, uh, so, my parents, I guess, of big. My brother had a really good taste in music, so he had a lot of tapes and records around, stuff that I didn't know. So I got to, to check out a lot of that older music, you know, bands from the 60s, psychedelic era, uh, era. and then uh, getting into more older blues musicians, um, just from my older brother and hang around with his group of friends. Mm -hmm. So that was a big influence. Um, you know, at my school, they would take us to the symphony once every once in a while, and that was really cool. Uh, and going when I was in Columbia, um, well, well, I was born in New Orleans, so growing up as a little kid, I was there till three, but then we'd go back every year. So I remember just walking by myself as a little kid around the quarter. Uh -huh. which is kind of scary now, but I used to do it all the time. I would just leave for an hour and just go walk around like Bourbon Street by myself. and You can hear a lot of music that way. Yeah. You can. Yeah, I have images of these guitarists. I remember this guy holding like a, an orange, like uh, you'd walk in. It was in the middle of the day, and he was using his microphone stand as a slide. He was just doing, I mean, you're a kid. This is kind of bizarre. What is this guy doing? You know, <laughs> kind of Jimi Hendrix kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, that, that's also a big thing. And I think uh, people forget if you're from that area and how unique that is, the New Orleans and just the amount of music there is. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. There are styles that don't exist anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's true. And, but just that it's just like, like water. It's just everywhere. You know, yeah. it's like, like food. You just you have to have it, you know. <laughs> And the kids really pick up on it. So I think those are some of the influences. So you were almost born a guitar player, or almost grew up a guitar player. I grew really. up, yeah. My mom played, and you'd, she could play. She still plays. And um, and then, you know, then they put us in, you know, I started in first grade piano and played till 12th grade or something. Wow. And I wasn't very good. <laughs> but I could play. I can play one hand really well. Either hand. I just cannot <laughs> do them together. That's about where I'm That's at. That's me. Yeah. 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 yeah, so. But it's useful. It still is useful. And the piano was a useful tool with guitar because guitar is such an oddball instrument. Piano's linear. You can only play that one note in one place. Where on the guitar, you can play one note in four to five different places mm. with different fingers and different. So it's much more. It's not a linear instrument. Right. It's a pattern yeah. oriented. Um, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. So, <laughs> but if you use a piano, in my mind, it still makes everything easier. So that was something that really helped me out as a kid is having played piano. Being able yeah. to relate it to. To guitar. relate it to anything. Yeah. It's sort, of the the it's sort of the universal instrument, <clears throat> at least in, in terms of teaching and pedagogy. I think so. I think yeah. it's the best, so far, the best structure or visual way of identifying harmony, intervals. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. We always like to ask this question, but I think I already know the answer. Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Because <laughs> I didn't think you already answered it. Did you find the guitar or did the guitar find you? It's kind of both, I guess. Uh -huh. I mean, I remember my parents, uh, I remember my first guitar lesson. Uh -huh. There used to be, because I was interested in taking violin around the same time, there was this place called Miller Violin Shop. Yeah. It used to be on, right on Green Springs. Anyway, this place in town is this little old couple. They were very old. They were in their like late, like early 80s making <laughs> violins and selling them. And I remember going there, my teacher, he, he ended up moving and had a lesson there. So I was around violins, around guitar, and it just stuck. And I just really, and my dad said, do you want to keep doing this? And like, he just, and I said, yes, you know, it was just something I really enjoyed, even though I, something, something about it that I wanted to keep wanting to learn about. Mm, that's great. Yeah. So that was kind of the moment. We can all relate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you play, you play a lot of jazz. I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, as much as you can, um, here in the city, there is some jazz, but there's not so many venues for it all the time. Right. You'll get it sporadically, so there's not many clubs where you have seven nights, seven nights a week jazz. So, hey, oh, is there any anymore? There I was. A... There are, and not here, yeah. uh, but there yeah. used to be. There used to be a place called Grundy's. Hmm. Yeah. That was before my time, uh, but that was in like uh, a jazz bar here mm -hmm. where they had yeah. live music most of the week. Yeah. yeah. And then when we're not play when you're not playing jazz, you play I blues. Well, I grew up playing blues. I mean, I really liked you got into like Led Zeppelin and um, um, that kind of Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, those type, yeah. Eric Clapton, those kind of people. And then you obviously go back and you're like, whoa, those people that those British guys listen to people from this area. And right. I always thought there was a lot of blues here, but there really isn't so much blues in Alabama. There's a few, but you really have to go to Mississippi, mm -hmm. Texas, yeah. some Tennessee. 
Right, so a little yeah. bit of here, Johnny yeah. Shines and people like that. So in any case, I always wonder, why can't I find a blues band to play in? <laughs> and there never was. And there was jam bands, and I got <clears throat> started getting into that, you know, out of the psychedelic music. Right, um, yeah. And I got into that, and then uh, and from that, I kind of morphed into jazz. Is it hard rock stuff? It was hard rock and then jazz. And so, yeah. which one am I going to do more? And so I kind of veered more <laughs> into jazz and the yeah. hard rock stuff. Yeah, I'm just hearing a, a plethora of styles here, from jazz to blues to uh, rock to you yeah. know, sort of psychedelic rock to, to uh, jazz again. Yeah, I like yeah. the Grateful Dead is kind of like a little hybrid, but yeah, then I like more the art rock, like the Jethro Tull and mm-hmm. uh, and Yes, and then uh, and then like uh, you, I still have a thing for South American music, especially with guitar, and I never grew up playing using my fingers, and uh, so there was an amazing guitarist who came here to study. He had he had friends who were in the symphony here, and he played this instrument called the tiple, which is like a a tenor guitar. It's instead of a twelve string with six six sets of two strings. Mm. Right. The jingle jangle jangly sounding guitar. Yeah. It was four. Anyway, this guy was like he had won all these awards, and he was learning cello, and he's an amazing guitar. So I got to study with him in high school. And it was like a reality check. He's like, yeah, he's pretty good, meaning me, but his fingers don't work, you know. <laughs> so it's just it's good to get that, like, positive reinforcement and negative. But <laughs> right. So from that, I got to learn some traditional Colombian uh, uh, string music, like mountain, Andean music, mountain music. Wow, like, They're great. called bambucos and pasillos, yeah. a lot of waltzes. Huh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Would you say those things have influenced your style now when you when you go to write a song? All yeah, that stuff I, it's weird. In? I write a lot of songs in three. <laughs> I don't know. I don't write many songs in four. Even when I write it, just a song, like with words yeah, for myself, because I'm not a good singer. But uh, they're usually in three. Oh, that's interesting. And they always, in live that music when I was growing up, the music always... There's a section major, and then the bridge will always go to minor. Right. Mm-hmm. And it, it has this kind of structure to it. And, yeah. and for some reason, I use that in my songs. You know, you just pick up stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It all becomes a part of, of you know, who you are as a musician, I think. I guess so, yeah. yeah. And, you know, you know, I played in one of these modern Hillsong church kind of things where you have, like, three reverb pedals and four delay pedals. <laughs> That's your sound. It's more about the sound than what you're playing. Mm-hmm. Which is fine, <laughs> but you learn it's just another style. So it's kind of cool to learn that kind of stuff. And bluegrass, I'm not good at, but at least I kind of understand the structure and the kind of the rhythm. That does not come easy to me. Flat picking. Flat picking, just it's very painful to me. I just don't have the arm of steel, the right arm of steel to do that. But. Yeah. You have to keep the whole arm rigid, don't you? It's like and there's, it's almost... there's in the, some of the, the vocabulary. It's all about how your fingers fit on the guitar versus what scale you're using. Mm. So all that chromaticism, these notes, that non-diatonic, since we're talking theory stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure. Uh, just It's just about how it lays on your fingers where you are in the neck of the guitar it deci- is why you play those notes, not necessarily because you're in a scale. Mm. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> but I'm not good at that. I'm kind of more traditional, unless it's blues. And with blues, I'm more flexible. But right. if it's otherwise, I'm kind of, I guess that all that schooling kind of affected me. <laughs> it so affects all of us. Yeah. So when you say when you're writing your own music or you have, if you're describing your own style of music, you're saying you, you automatically kind of go to the waltzes. I go to songs in three. I go to like more new agey kind of music, uh-huh. kind of more open-ended sounding music. Um, uh, I'm Consonant. not sure why. Consonant or a little open, like no lyrics. It's just a mood. Uh, if you like, for example, some of these bands like uh, with open-ended jams. Mm-hmm open-ended improv. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not about just a lead guitar. Sometimes it's about this kind of organic thing that happens when a band develops a groove or a pattern. And and I like that kind of music. So open-ended sounding music, yeah. That's great. It's actually, I think a lot of contemporary classical has gone that way uh, in in a lot of years, you know, kind of going towards uh, things that are attempting to create a mood you know, more sure. so than having a beginning, a middle, and an end, or, or sure. a melody, quote unquote. You know, it's something that's trying to create more of a mood, and, and, more and it's also sometimes not experience. an issue of virtuosity. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It's just uh, just set like a Steve Reich. I love Steve Reich. You know. Oh yeah. And some of that stuff is virtuosic, just because you have to the mental challenge of. The rhythms and stuff. Yeah, but, but you're only playing four notes for ten minutes. Yeah, and and but, and for and for our listeners who may not know, Steve Reich is a minimalist, mm-hmm. and he he's he's famous for having 
uh, something very, very repetitive, but then he, he created a technique called phasing. Mm -hmm. So two people might be doing the same thing, but one, it will then play at an eighth note behind. Sure. The same, and, then a, and then a quarter note. And, and it'll slow. And then it, the, the whole, the appearance, it's like taking a picture and turning the picture sideways. It's the same picture, <laughs> but it looks like a, something else. Right, yeah. And you turn it upside down, it's your mom's picture, and upside down, it's, well, who is that? You know, and but it's your mom. You yeah. don't know that's your mom. It's the same. <laughs> and that's pretty cool. And you find that in different kind of, like, gamelan music, or yeah, you, you just take, or you hear, like, Afro-Cuban, you have all these people playing just a simple part and just depending on where they put the note it creates a mood or a mm. and a color or a it's pretty cool very cool yeah. so the more you learn this kind of hard stuff if you can simplify it, i find that interesting how to take all this difficult stuff and then boil it down to something easy accessible that people like this sort of becomes more than the sum of its parts mm -hmm. yes yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so you've talked we've talked a little bit about um your instructors were there particular instructors that that uh, you felt really were very good that had did they have particular methods that you liked or disliked? I think when you with guitar, I'm just going to talk about guitar at least at first. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, I had a classical guitarist uh, teacher, a guy named Brian Luter, Letterby or Luterby. Ah, uh, yeah. And he's great. He's great. Great uh, as far as. You learn the pedagogy, you start with a certain era, and you learn to develop the basic technique, and then you teach them some music. It's really just learning songs, learning pieces of a certain level that you're able to play, or you're almost able to play, and then you move on to another era. And with jazz, it's a little harder because the eras go by so fast. Instead of being 50 years of one type of music, it's boiled down to like eight. Huh. You know, like modal jazz was maybe almost 10 years. I mean, people still do it now, but the, like when it was like the thing to do, or free jazz, well, that still happened, but when it was the new thing, yeah. it, when everybody seemed to be doing it, it was a short amount of period of time. Or swing, 10 years. Yeah. So it's hard to find, especially guitar music, there's not so much guitar music for... That, that was the original, it was not the original instrument for some of this stuff. Yeah. So it's a guessing game when it comes to jazz. <laughs> if I'm just teaching rock and roll or just, you know, you start with this, the basic, you learn the basic idea of chords, how to, the, the uh, basics of rhythm, counting, uh, so you don't get lost, how to right. play with other people, and then you just learn more and more pieces. Sometimes you start with the most modern and go backwards. Or, with, depending on style, you start with the oldest, like classical music, to the most modern. Huh. So yeah. it just depends what who you're dealing with. Like, especially for me, um, if I'm teaching at home and a private student or at school, you know, the requirements are different. So what about those requirements? What do you... What do you expect from your students? How? What is a student who is doing well? What is, what is that student doing? How do they do a good job? I you guess think? you have to go... If they're going to be there for, say, if they study with you for two years, at the end of the whole thing, they should have some concept of, uh, well, their foundation and harmony, be able to know your scales, blah, blah, mm. blah, that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, be able to read. And why do you read? Because it's information. Right. And if you don't, if you can't get the information, you're not useful to be able functional with other people uh, because they're able to get the information faster. Oh, like, yeah. It's, you know. It's the, it's the same as being illiterate in words. That's you exactly know? right. You could, you know, I mean, you can face real challenges if you don't know how to read music. You know? And the communication just goes by so much faster in a practical sense. Mm -hmm. And your understanding of, what, of how the music is constructed you know, can, can be very dependent on your ability to not just hear it, but, but also see it. I, I think it's possible for people. There are people much better than me who don't read at all. Right. But for the majority of us human beings, reading helps to be able to. So at the end of a certain amount of time, the reading helps so that you can learn a lot more on your right. own. Right. You need to be, yeah. able to be able to teach yourself. That's one thing mm -hmm. in a general way. But they should know, uh, have some knowledge of pieces from different eras hmm. and be able to know the difference of what's era you're listening to of music. People think jazz. Jazz is many things, just like rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to play in the style of any of those genres. Yeah. 
So I think one of the coolest things I learned in college and my undergraduate the word aesthetics. And I always thought that's, that was one of the coolest things. It's kind of basically a laundry list of what defines a style of music. Right, yeah. Like swing music, you know, there's a swing rhythm and the type, the harmonies are more complex. So that's what I try to teach a guitarist. You know, learning to use play with the pick, learning to use your fingers, learning to improvise, learning to sight read. Yeah. Those uh -huh. are just all different talents. Some people are, be are better at certain aspects of it. Yeah, and different different styles pursue different aesthetics. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, um, so if, like blues, like some people think blues is Jimi Hendrix, or now it's Steve Ray Vaughan. <laughs> when it, and, and so, but then they don't think, well... Uh, you know, the other people play that style. So you have right. to listen to a lot of musicians. So you also have to teach people how to listen to music. Yeah, mm -hmm. to me, Stevie Ray Vaughan is coming towards the end of blues. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, no, no, he's fantastic. So he's yeah. fantastic. But it's, yeah. but yeah, but it's, he's, he's still kind of recent. You know? Yeah, there's, 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 there's such a huge tradition of blues, you know, before you get up to what Stevie Ray Vaughan is. And he's amassed all of those. He, he listened to all of that. You know, right, so exactly right. So you, you might have Lightning Hopkins. Who's in, you hear him as a guy who sings, plays guitar with, you know, with an acoustic guitar. He drops the beat every once in a while, but it works somehow, and it's still <laughs> fantastic. It's a whole different thing than uh, Chuck Berry, or you know. Right. And so you have to know what ex you have to be able to define what makes this music different from another. What how is it part? Of, what aesthetically? How is it unique? Right, and that's yeah. something as a guitar player is very helpful because then they'll figure out how to play each style and then they'll choose what they like and be good at that one style. Sure, yeah. You know, it's just helping them look at, understand what they're listening to and how you apply it to the guitar. Yeah. A question about uh, reading music since we kind of talked about sure. it just a little bit. How important do you think that is uh, for your students I compared think to it tablature, for it, example? It, Okay, I'll start with reading. I mean, what is your goal? Like, you know, you have students who just want to learn some songs, which is good. But if they're just learning it just to, for their own enjoyment and that's the end of it is one thing. But if you're learning to find a profession, mm -hmm. you are expected to do things other people can't do. Yeah. It's that kind of simple. Sure. Like, mm. And so um, for that reason, if I'm needing to learn how to play some song I just play it you know or it takes a little bit of time for me to learn so I read something so that's helpful so there are two different ways of reading music on the guitar it's standard notation with the five lines you know with the treble clef or bass clef whatever then there's something called tablature and from my understanding that I'm not a historian of classical guitar but I think that system is actually as old uh, with the as as the notation we have hmm. Uh, for I think you may be right about that. Yeah, um, it's it's evolved over the years, but uh, some kind of tablature is as old as the guitar. I yeah. mean, it goes back to the the you know the Renaissance guitar Spanish guitar players and things. Yes, so fifteen so hundreds, and you know what we think of the guitar now with the round shape uh, that you think of uh, Spanish guitar, you know, with that tan kind of color, mm -hmm. all acoustic. That's kind of comes from Spain, but there were guitars around before, but different sizes. There were lutes, massive things. So um, anyway, okay. that system tablature is really useful for a lot of young students because it's very difficult to sight read on a guitar. Like mm. I said on the piano, if I ever saw a middle C, the little <laughs> black dot with the one little line through it, the ledger line, <laughs> that's in the very center of the piano. And I, can dem well, I can't really demonstrate it, but you can hear it. So I'm gonna play one note, you know, this is middle C on one string, here it is on another string, here's another string, here's another string. <laughs> I'm running out of frets now. <laughs> so um, it just, it makes it so much harder to, like, where do I play? There's five ways, there's ten ways to play this. Mm -hmm. So if you just tell them exactly what fret to play it on, and that's how tablature helps you play, there's a line that re represents a string, and there's a number, and that's what fret you play. It's, it doesn't tell you what fingers or how fast or slow to play it. You just That part you have to use just your innate kind of natural mm. uh, sense of musicality. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so I think both are good, but the tablature at, a, at it, it's gonna it, it only has like half the information. Right. We kind of talked about how you can't really get a sense of dynamics. <clears throat> 
you know, with tablature. Well, yes, and there's other things that you find on standard notation. Well, I guess you could put that also on, on tablature, but, you know, how loud to play, what type of attack, or you want an emotional kind of component, you know. Um, rhythmic values. Rhythmic, yeah. Rhythmic values you usually don't find ones. that in tablature, but uh, modern tablature. I'm not sure about classical tablature. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know about classical tablature myself either. And, of course... Written sheet music is a universal language, so mm -hmm. the thing that you could play on a guitar could conceivably also get played on a piano. That's right. Know. Right. Yeah, a piano player would have no idea how to play something in tablature. You know, well, it's yeah. just not giving him any information, really. Yeah. You know? It makes would make no sense unless they already played guitar. So right. I, I can look at a tablature and then I kind of like slowly <laughs> play it. But that's a lot of translating in my head to, when I, to be to do it on the fly. When yeah. I was first in college, when I first started playing and, and learning to read, I was very good at reading tablature because that's what I'd done as a teenager and not so great at, at reading actual music. Mm -hmm. As I learned to read actual music over the years, I realize now I'm I'm good at reading music. I'm not as great at reading tablature anymore. I've got it kind of doesn't come as naturally uh, as it I, used I guess to. I'm the same way, <laughs> especially when you do things like bending, bending notes. When you bend a string, it makes the note sound higher. So, mm. do you when you write tablature? Do you write the note that where you're putting your fingers or <laughs> where it sounds like it is? So mm. that's a little confusing. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah, in sheet music, we have a symbol for that. Nice, nice, yeah. happy little, you know. Oh, the little, slit. little con like curve up. Yeah, there. the little slur up thing. Uh, so, practicing. Practicing. How yes. much do you practice? It goes in waves. Uh, yeah. If I'm working a lot and I'm playing a lot um, out, practice less. I practice less, and yeah. sometimes. Um, you have to really I have to motivate. If I have something coming up. Um, like a, some kind of concert or a gig. Uh, well, I have to learn the music, and in the music, and if we're improv type music, well, you have to be able to improv over it. And some tunes are harder than others, or some might have a rhythm or a chord change that might be unusual. So, how am I going to get through that? And um, so, as far as a schedule, you know, as far as I still practice a lot more classical guitar than jazz guitar, which is really weird, because <laughs> I don't ever get to play classical guitar. Right, yeah, so. But it also, if you develop a good right hand, you know, with a, um, arpeggios and uh, tremolo, that sort of thing, um, it helps with my picking. It, it, so it's just like, if you like working out, if you just like lift weights with your left arm, yeah. and then you don't use your right arm, then it's <laughs> going to be kind of uneven. So if I use all my fingers and practice using my fingers, then when I use a pick, which I use a lot more for jazz and rock and roll, right, right. that helps. Uh, scheduling, I'll try to find something I'm really bad at and then work on that for like two or three weeks. Okay. That's, that's, a, that's a, a great tip. Yeah. And then and then I'll always play a tune like I was trying to, I'm bad with sweeps. You know, a sweep is... <laughs> You know, I can do it in one direction really easy, but the other way is really hard for me. So I've been trying to just pick it up and just do that for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I, I practice and, my sweeps on the bass a lot for that very same reason, because it's, it, it feels awkward. Is, and, and it is, and so I have to really sit and like, oh my gosh, I'm like 14 again. I'm like, yeah. I cannot do yeah. this. Yeah. So I do that. Um, that's the main thing, you know. Uh, if I'm going to have to do a recording, make sure I'm going through the pieces to memorize them or a gig. Yeah. It depends what, what are you practicing for. If I'm just running scales for scales, that's cool too if I'm not good at it. So yeah. if I get to a comfortable space, sometimes you have to practice playing for speed because I'm not, I, I have a slow hands. I have slow mm -hmm. hands. My right hand just does not go past 130. It just <laughs> will not. And I know that from practicing. Right. So I have to find other ways to play at a faster tempo. And you do that, you, I, you're kind of planning ahead. Why am I practicing? Otherwise, you're just playing songs. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You do that all day. <laughs> and that's fine, but I know people who know hundreds of songs, but uh, they can't necessarily break out of their little box. Yeah. You know? There's always going to be a lot of things you can't do if, if you just... if you pra it, it seems to me that if you're practicing... What feels comfortable for you, mm -hmm. it's uh, it can be a great ego boost. You, know, yeah. you, you feel better about yourself because you're doing it well. You d you're but, doing what you're already good at. Yeah, you're doing what you're already good at. But but you know you ask yourself, well, are you progressing when you do that? 
you know. So I guess on the guitar, uh, when I was practicing a lot more, I would do right hand exercises to get warmed up. You know, I would do like arpeggios with my right hand, different patterns. Um, I'll do this one for like a 30 seconds to a set tempo. Mm. Example, using my first three fingers, uh, the block chords. Things like that, then scales uh, with my fingers, and then I'll practice scales with my right hand. And instead of just playing one scale and over and over, and on guitar, you can fall into a pattern where you just play the same scale, just like bar chords. It's the same shape. Mm. Uh, I'll try to play all the scales, like all twelve, in one position. That's something one of my teachers showed me, and using the circle of fifths. Mm. The circle of fifths is just like certain keys, like if I'm in the key of C, you just go up five letters. You can use uh, your pinky, your fingers, uh, C, D, and E, F, G. And check then, out episode, what episode number was that, Jeremy, oh, when we discussed the up. circle of fifths? We did have an episode called Circle of There's an episode so, called Circle of Fifths, so go check that so, out. So and, and every time you go up one of the circle of fifths, you just change one note. So if you learn your notes really well on the guitar, in one area of the guitar, when you play this other scale, it's just going to be slightly different. And then when you go up a fifth, it's going to be just slightly different, and it keeps changing. So C, then I go up to G. New note. New note. Oh, that's great. And then you go up a fifth, and then yeah. that note was, that's a C sharp. Well, we didn't have C sharp in the key of C. Yeah. And I do that, and then I'll do this, then I'll do arpeggios. And then you practice that sort of thing. And you can do that. Etc. And then uh, then I try to learn that. Uh, then you can practice scales and patterns and intervals. Uh, then you try to do that with other types of scales. That's just major. So really yeah. no major. If you don't can't do major, don't worry about all these weird scales. Just right. no major. Learn, on learn your major. instrument, like mm -hmm. where you don't have to know all twelve and then, yeah. then worry about all these other scales. Yeah. That's the scale we use to reference all the other scales. It's right. like it's the gold standard. It's, yeah. 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 It's a fascinating history of its own. So uh. So to me it sounds like one way that you challenge yourself is to just you know your weaknesses and just sit there and, and base them head on. Let yeah. me let me say one thing. Uh, what I was saying earlier about you know try to find something that you're not good at and practice it. Um, playing with other people, you, some people get a false sense of how good they are. <laughs> <laughs> they think they're really good at something until they're put in a situation with other musicians, maybe of a even of a worse level. But it can, obviously with people at a bit at a higher level than yourself when you play uh whether it be classical bluegrass jazz whatever you'll find that you think you're really good at something but then you play out then you struggle yeah. so that's a good judge of how good you are or what you need to work on mm -hmm. listening to what another person is doing is a is a skill that can only be gained by playing with other people mm -hmm. sure you know and i don't care how tight you think your rhythm is you know until you're playing with a bunch of people who all have to stay in the same rhythm you know, it because, like I said, you know, you could be the best person on the stage, and then you're playing with people who aren't as good as or you. Or not, and then and then you have to be able to adjust. So yeah. even though you might be right, well, right, yeah. if you just say, "Well, you're wrong, and I'm right," <laughs> that's not going to help anybody. Are you really the so best you, musician at that point? Or are you I'm the one person who <laughs> to make it work? You have to work with people. So someone, yeah. for example, if I'm in a band, and the drummer's slowing down. Right. I could just say, I'm going to just keep going my own speed. And then you, suddenly it sounds like two people playing different songs. Mm. You have to work. And that's from learning to listen. Yeah. And then learning to also know how much you can let that person slow down without saying, hey, man, you're hey, slowing man, like, down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. there's, a, you, there's a limit each yeah. way. I played in rock bands. All my drummers sped up. So I had the opposite problem. When to stop being polite <laughs> and start being a musician. Well, and I rush. I always still rush. So I have to work on that. And that's sometimes listening to drummers. And that's just that's something I learned from playing with people that I tend to rush, and that's something I learned from. Yeah, invaluable being experience. In yeah. yeah, important. You probably own a few guitars. Yeah. Which one do you have a favorite? Or is that even fair? Well, to I ask? just bought this guitar uh -huh. just last week. I was at the. It was a rainy day. Uh, the guitar is beautiful, the by the store. way. It's a it's a Bulgarian guitar. It's a Cremona. Huh. 
And apparently some guitar teacher in town ordered it, but it came with electronics, so he didn't want it. <laughs> but it's slightly shorter scale. I'm not a big guy. Mm -hmm. So it's like maybe an inch shorter than a standard classical. Oh, God. I and, but it has a wider bass. neck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I bought it. So so I have a, this guitar. It's called a Cremona. It sounds beautiful. And I so I have... Um, what was your question? What do I own more than one well, guitar? Well, um, do you have a particular one that you enjoy the most? Or? Well, I have one that I had made for me in Colombia, and uh, there is a certain type of guitar. Like I said before, in Colombia we have more string instrument music, and then we have more instru instruments uh, type of music that uses more horns, piano, I think like salsa music. So, but if you uh, Andean music, yeah, uh, there's an instrument that's called a requinto. And it's basically like a guitar with a capo on the third fret. So mm. if you play a C chord, it's actually an E flat. And it's that guitar that does a... <laughs> that kind of sound uh -huh. um, that you hear in that kind of boleros and stuff. Absolutely. Love um, it. That sort of thing. Yeah. So I had that, and there's a guy named Tito. So I went anyway. I went in the store looking for one. It was my cousin who lives in Cali. He said, "Well, look, man, on the on the sticker on the inside of the guitar, there's his address. Let's just go to his store." <laughs> we drove to this like warehouse district, and there he was. And so I said, "I wanted a, cl a concert," and he said, "Well, what do you want on it?" And I said, "Well, I want like a round sound hole, and I want the fretboard to kind of go float over." And he built it for me. It's really no cool. Way. So I have it, and that I only that's the guitar I don't ever take out. I just leave it at home. That's my little fun for myself. Mm, wow. Every other instrument I have is I have a use for it. I'm not a rich guy or anything, so I I like nice guitars. But if I don't use them, I end up getting rid of them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have different types of guitars for different settings. I have nylon guitars. So originally these guitars, you know, they're made out of wood. But some of the parts, like the bridge, where what the strings rest on, used to be made out of bone, for example. Now they use plastic, but nice guitar style bone. Mm -hmm. The strings used to be, unfortunately, out of like uh, lamb guts. I hate to say that, but that's what they're made out of. And uh, so, with the advent of nylon and, and uh, plastics, um, we don't use that. And then steel strings, we don't have to kill animals in order to have <laughs> guitar music. It's my understanding cat gut was just a, a general term. It really was typically lamb. Lamb. And you can still buy those, for example, on ukuleles. You can go online, look on YouTube, and they show you the process of they'll wash them, they hang them, the, yeah. how they you wind them, they wow. dry them. And there is a difference in sound. Just like uh, drums, drum heads used to use lamb skin. Yeah. And there's a sound. Yeah. And um, just like, you know, like some old classical guitars use rosewood. Um, and some of those, not so many of those trees around. So mm -hmm. um, th the result is the guitars that you buy now sound different. Mm -hmm. But in any case, I have, uh, this is a classical. I have a classical that I dropped on the floor. It no mm -hmm. longer works. And then I have another one that just is worn out, a, ja a Japanese mm -hmm. one, a Takamini. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The one, and then I have a steel string guitar. I have a couple of those. And then I have a, a Strat, uh, like a 335, like a... And then I have an arch top guitar, I uh, think like a Joe Pass kind of guitar. And oh. then I have uh, then I have a little smaller instruments like Colombian instruments, a requinto, uh, a bandolo, which is kind of a mandolin instrument, Ooh. a mandolin, a, um, a tiple, a um, charango, which is think of like uh, El Condor Pasa with, you know that. We talked about that in our Ch pentatonic used skill to be, episode. Used to be, it has the shape of an armadillo because traditionally they don't do it anymore. It would use an armadillo shell uh -huh. as the shape. Uh -huh. So when you see a requinto, it's the shape of an armadillo. And that's, you don't really see that anymore. But uh, So I have all those and then a banjo and then. Five string? A five string, but I take a string off. I play it like a four string. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, this is just backwards to me. I just try. It's so hard. <laughs> mentally, not the fingers, just the mentally, where the notes are. It's it's like a, anyway, uh, it's amazing those guys here can do it. I've got a tenor banjo that I just tune for, as mandolin tuning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I can understand that. That's mm -hmm. why I tune it that way. Um, and the strings can handle that, the, the amount of tension. So, uh -huh. so yeah, those are what I have. I, and then I also have a bass, a uh, bass guitar. And um, and then I have a piano and organ, just 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 for writing or for gigs. Mm. You gotta have those available. The guitar is like shoes. You can't go out, you know, to a wedding and your 
and your flip flops, <laughs> or vice versa. You know, right. They have different roles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Yeah. Do you want to talk about amps? Maybe just. Eh. What do you think? I have one amp. Okay. <laughs> hey, there we go. That's easy. I really <laughs> have. I have a little amp, little <laughs> practice amps, and then there's a guy in town. I got named Sam Timberlake who makes yeah. great vin- uh, custom amps and. I've had one, this one, for like 10 years or more. Yeah, or 12 years. Great amp. He makes really, and he can make them. He's a guy who can make it sound like a traditional Fender amp, or it can be like a hot rod amp, you know. All in one amp, you know. Does Sam Timberlake have his own shop here in Birmingham, or is he working He works at a place called Highland Music. Highland Music, yeah. And, but, uh, so he repairs amps and things, but he also builds his own amps and sells them online through the store. Mm. And I highly recommend them. Birmingham listeners, check them out. Yeah, Sam of, Amp, like one word, but Sam the word Amp. Sam and Amp together. He's been doing it for at least 20 years, seems like. It's got to be 15, maybe. Yeah, maybe. yeah, that I know of. Cool, cool. Um, <laughs> here we go. Um, <laughs> what are your thoughts on six plus, like seven string instruments, like multiple string? Uh, you know, it's pretty cool. I mean, it just depends what you want. I mean, like uh, Steve Vai had like a super small string on the top and he would take a mandolin string. <laughs> so it was the last string. And he could get these extremely high notes uh-huh. and that's kind of rare. Most people, they put a, an extra string on the bottom. Right, yeah. Uh-huh. That's what um, I'm more familiar with. So you hear it now on all these, <laughs> these kind of these thrash kind of bands. I don't know what you call it. Uh, where they tune everything down to low C's and low... Yeah. But, uh, but in a lot of Brazilian music, they have a vilau. It's like a six-string classical guitar with an extra low. Mm-hmm. And that guy's job, there's no upright bass player. He's like... He's doing I think that. I've seen that before. Yeah, yeah, and so he's doing rhythm. Um, but then he's doing all these bass lines that are counterpoint to the melody, which is really cool. And mm-hmm. they get these really great low sounds. Mm-hmm. It looks just like a classical guitar. <laughs> So I like that because I like a lot of Brazilian stuff. Uh, it's it's just a lot to think about. I use the big string on the guitar as my anchor of everything. Hmm. So when I've played a five string bass for for fun oh, or yeah. out of necessity, that messed with me. Yeah, I could not play it. Yeah. <laughs> then that's just me getting old, I guess. If I was younger, and I probably would be fine with it. So. Nah. Uh, just a, just a, <laughs> I was just uh, a learned skill, man. It's just something a you just gotta skill. do over. Because I got a five, I got sick of it. I was like, I got my five string bass, and I was just sick of it. I couldn't get my hands in there to slap and pop, and which you know, I didn't do. You always end up playing the like a down a fifth. You <laughs> play, end up playing the the same progression in the wrong key. <laughs> and I think my resting place is with my finger on the low E string. It's kind of my my resting yeah. default position. So yeah, I can see that. Well, you can still do that. I get. I just would. I'm visual, so yeah. it would just mess. So you up. see, now when I go to a four string, I, I feel like I don't have enough strings. Uh, I'm constantly trying to go down to play on that fifth string, and it's not there. You hear I that? Think, lo- you ah, want to hear that low? Ah. Yeah. yeah. No. But that that's just me. <laughs> yeah. So how do you maintain your instrument? How do you keep it um, at its best? Okay. Mm. Well, uh, because these instruments are made out of wood, uh, keep them away from the window. Just like they say in pianos, don't put them against the, you know, in the sunlight where it heats up the instrument and cools it down. Mm-hmm. Or don't put it against the wall where it heats up, you know, put an mm. interior wall. These keep them away from your air conditioning or your heating because they can dry out. And like if it's rainy, they're made out of wood. They absorb. So they will actually expand and contract. So in the winter, it's probably the worst time, especially mm. if it's dry and then you're having central heating. Keep them in the case away from any kind of uh, central heat. Mm. Um, so that's the first thing. As far as changing strings, you know, I change the strings when they start to uh, strings by the way they when they get worn out just like old shoes don't bounce back you know like mm-hmm. the soles the strings will they first of all they they the they start some more muffled more mm-hmm. and then they start playing out of tune so i could tune the open string but as soon as i get to the third fret it'll be a, it'll sound out of tune so that's the time to change it um uh, you know wipe the guitar down you know if you're using people sweat mm. and the oil and sweat gets builds up you know just yeah um and if you if if you just keep it in the case and you don't expose the don't leave it in your car like in the winter or in the hot summer, it should be fine if it's a good instrument. But if you if something cracks or something, take it to the guitar store. I mean, mm-hmm. most instruments, even if they break the neck, it can be rep- fixed. Mm-hmm. But you know, avoid that. Yeah, <laughs> avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's minor, like especially for bass players. Because you're, all you're doing is touching your your instruments with your hands. So yeah. when you're getting those little dead skin particles and sweat and all those little things in there, it's 
kind of um, takes away from the brightness of the strings. It tends yes. to build up yes. and deaden them. And that deadening yeah. can be so nat so gradual that if you play all the time, you know, you don't necessarily notice it mm -hmm. until you get new strings and I go, wow. Oh, oh, yeah. Changing strings does get expensive though. If you have more than one guitar and you play a lot, you know, some yeah. people can go through a set of strings in a couple of nights. If they, some people just from the amount of uh, acid or, or oil, I'm sorry, in your fingers and it's just the way it reacts or if they sweat, it just, you just gotta get, they just, they have to change them. Uh, luckily, I'm not that way. I can go a pretty long time with a set of strings. Well, very good, man. All right, here is the obligatory history lesson. Oh, wow. For our listeners. <laughs> okay, well, help me friends. out here. Uh, that's so long. It's like, where do we start? Uh, it's obligatory <laughs> now. Uh, it is obligatory. Because we said we were gonna do some history. Did we? Okay. At some point, we promised history to, to these people. Oh, well, we promised music history. Music we still, history. We still have never, <laughs> never delivered. We did one episode on um, prehistoric music. Uh, you're right, yeah. And that's about as close as we got. Does it count as history if it's prehistoric? Hmm. Mm. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> according to uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica. You still have one of those? Oh, awesome. I got a whole set of them. Nice. Nah, I got it on the internet, oh, okay. on the interwebs. See, that was But they have a website. Yeah, they do. Yeah. All right. Um, like you were saying, actually, it originated in Spain. Now, there were other kind of guitar, like you were saying, the lutes. There are um, lutes. That's more of a European. There's the oud, um, which is more Middle Eastern. Uh, there were mandolins. Mm -hmm. So mandolins are basically like uh, fret. What makes guitar unique is that it has frets. Frets are those little metal uh, wire that they kind of hammer into the neck of the guitar and you would that was around there were like uh there were violas viola de gambas you know that look like a viola or mm -hmm. like a sorry like a cello um and but they have frets on them so it's been around a long time mm -hmm. what made this guitar unique is the finding the right shape mm -hmm. the size because lutes were massive you know and um they're like six feet across you know um and the right shape and the number of strings. Mm. And then, because even early guitars, they did not have the standard tuning of E, A, D, G, B, E. A lot of times would have a have an F sharp, like a lute tuning. Mm. Uh, or they would tune them to F, with the F as the bass note. So it wasn't just the six strings, it was coming up with the standard tuning using the, the standard notes of E, A, D, G, <laughs> B, and E. And uh, apparently that happened in Spain. I guess Spain was kind of a, like a melting pot, kind of like a, because of the Moors, the, right, yeah. the Arabic influence, and the Jewish influence, and the, the well, obviously the European, mm -hmm. the Iberian. Yeah, so, it, it created a musical culture that was unique in Europe. You know, yes. Like particularly unique in Europe. And, uh, and so that's why when you hear flamenco music, they have that weird... <laughs> that weird modal. Yeah. And you can think of that as kind of like sounding a lot like Arabic music, you know, that all that kind of stuff. Um, there's some of that there, the more modal kind of sound. But anyway, getting back to the guitar. So there were great teachers in, for example, in Italy. Um, but Spain is kind of where this body type Right, came about the, what we called the Spanish or nylon string or Spanish guitar mm -hmm. with the wasted body. Yeah, with like, like the curvy, like think of a woman. Yeah, mm -hmm. like the curvy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. As opposed to the more gourd shape of the bazooki or the oud or. Yes, and they were also very. You can call them parlor guitars, which are like the width, uh, um, much more narrow, mm -hmm. uh, almost like almost looking like a ukulele. Mm -hmm. You know, a little like between a standard guitar now and a ukulele. So. Right. Anyway. Very cool. Well, that was back in the, the 1500s, like you were saying, in Spain. It was the, the guitarra latina was the, I guess, oh, okay. the ancestor. Um, it was four strings and uh, with courses, like you were saying, or like a, like a 12 strings. Courses string. means uh, they would be like, instead of pressing like on a mandolin, mm -hmm. you'd press more than one string, but they were so close together, you'd treat them as one string. Right. And they were tuned to the same note. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like this. Instead of, it'd be two yeah. notes. Technically. Unison. Yeah. Like if you open up your piano and you play a note, you're really playing not just one string, you're playing three right beside each other mm -hmm. to get more volume. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I think I had for one of the original tunings was a CFAD tuning with uh, three courses and then the top was a single. Interesting. Note. Interesting. 
So I don't know the date of the six string version. There have been five string guitars, mm -hmm. different. Um, there have been guitar uh, hybrids, guitar harps. Mm -hmm. We have, and just we want some extra notes. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a lute. That's what a lute basically is. So you'll have a guitar, and then they just attach this massive thing, and there are these like five or six low notes that you play with no frets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a cool. Not one. even attached to the neck sometimes. Yeah, so and it's just it must weigh a ton. And and you have some more modern, especially like new age. I think of. Uh, Michael Hedge is one of the guys who made them popular. Now you see a lot of people using them. They're much more available. Well, it was in the um, the late 18th century that six, the sixth course was added. Oh, okay. Um, so then I was stand corrected. I thought it was much later. Well, and Not uh, much earlier. Well, actually, uh, just according to this, um, that's when they also added the well. They said they added a sixth course, and mm -hmm. then they also took off the courses. They just made it single strings towards. Oh. The, and 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 I stand corrected. I think when I said you know the, what the F sharp tuning, I think they call that the vihuela. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah. the vihuela yeah. is a. And actually, if you go to Mexico, they have something called the vihuela. But the vihuela in some of these older music uh, from the 1500s, it was a different type of instrument, shape wise, but it had six strings. Vihuela de mano. I'm not. I, did you, now I'm getting out of my. Uh, <laughs> Translate that. I don't want to just say no. Vihuela is a vihuela. That's okay. just a, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah. yeah, it's like a guitar is guitarra. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, some things do translate uh, differently. Well, you know, piano is a piano. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that came from the Italian word for floor. Well, uh, piano forte, so, and then piano, and then piano forte because it could uh, it could play soft, which was on the floor, or loud. You know. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, I guess, actually, let me go back, actually, because okay. just to my notes, the way I read it might not have actually come okay. out correct. Um, sure. It was actually between the 16th and 19th century that a lot of these changes were. Oh, out. okay. So you might have actually been correct in okay. that one. Uh, some of these changes included, like we said, the courses being added. Um, the violin peg box was re replaced by the head we all know today is the machine head. Yeah, the pegs, you literally, when you're tightening a string, you have a little... The strings are attached to this peg, like a piece of wood that goes through the slots in the on the headstock. And when you're done tuning the guitar, you have to jam, literally jam the wood of the peg into the neck mm -hmm. to keep the strings from loosening. And at some point, I guess when machining got more advanced, um, you you add these machines. It makes it much easier to keep the guitar in tune. Mm -hmm. And guitars go out of tune a lot. Yeah. So you need a, something that will keep the, that you can adjust very easily. Versus a piano, you need a technician to come to your house to tune your piano. <laughs> mm, I have a cello, and granted, it's not a very nice or great cello, but it's a cello no less. And I just remember yeah. trying to get like the get it, those it's, pegs in there. And it's scary. You it's think hard. you're going to break the strings? Yeah, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. My experience with my violin was was like I, I remember that too. Yeah, and, and my pegs were what didn't fit super well, you know. So mm -hmm. it, it was really hard to get to get them down in there enough to where the strings wouldn't wouldn't. Come and, and I think on my violins they have now all these little they call them fine tuners. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, just because it's so hard to use those, you know. But once you're in tune with those pegs, you're They'll, you'll good. stay there. <laughs> yeah. A second ago, we were talking about the um, the gut strings. Um, Way back when, that was actually how they they fretted them as well. They would uh, tie gut strings around where the frets would be. Oh my gosh! So. Kind of like a sitar, like a sitar with the movable mm. yeah. frets. Yeah. Depending on what raga you're gonna play, right, and yeah. you just oh, well, I'm not gonna play that raga, so I'll just take that <laughs> fret off. This is my understanding, but that's what I've heard. But that's that makes sense, yeah. So um, <coughs> so now another difference is uh, between this guitar and the other. I think uh, the, its ancestors had the frets were actually on the body of the guitar before the neck before they actually made it to where the neck extended to the sound hole, which is kind of a funny picture to see. Say that again. So, the guitar itself, um, the neck didn't actually extend to the sound hole. You had a piece of wood like the body would have gone oh, over it, that, and uh, that body itself had frets on it. Oh, interesting. Really weird. Oh, yeah, I think I have seen that before. Huh. So another another one of the changes, the variations on the theme. Yes. Mm -hmm. Before we landed at today's guitar, <laughs> um, you know the body changed a bit for sonority and stability. It became broader and more shallow, uh, with a more th a thinner soundboard. You want to tell us about the soundboard? 
So the soundboard, I guess, would be the box. The box. Mm -hmm. Okay, just like when you're at home and if you're lucky to have a sound system in your house and you have speakers, uh, you sound works through a medium. And um, sometimes to amplify the medium, the sound, you need, uh, before it goes out, the, the farther away you get from sound, the beginning is going to get weaker. So if you have a bigger box, the sound kind of builds it amplifies. Mm -hmm. So some of these old guitars in American music, for example, they have jumbos and things like that, just so you could be heard. Mm -hmm. And that's why banjos are so popular, because you couldn't hear a guitar that well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in any case, so um, the there are two basic type of guitars with a flat top uh, and then a rounded top, like a violin. Mm -hmm. So that has a lot to do with the way the sound gets pushed out of what we call the sound hole, the one hole on the guitar. Yeah. And and projects out forward away from it. Yeah. So I don't know if that helps at all, but um the the more you get to modern music, the smaller they become because amplification came around. Okay. And um and also the string sizes on guitars used to be much bigger because the bigger string, same thing, the medium the more you can project. But that really is physically really daunting. Some of the strings they used to use just, but it was at a necessity. Yeah, yeah. to be heard. Now we don't have to worry about that as much because of technology. Mm -hmm. Beautiful technology. Yes. <laughs> it's great until it doesn't work. Um, a lot of these changes we were talking about were attributed to the work of Antonio Torres of Andalusia. Are you familiar with him? No, no. As a builder? He was, a, he was known as one of the most important Spanish guitar makers of the 19th century. And uh, like I said, it, re it resulted in today's classical guitar with uh, three gut strings, well, now nylon, mm -hmm. as we were saying, and uh, three metal spun strings. That's right? correct, yes. Um, and that eventually became today's uh, six-string folk rock or whatever, you know, guitar. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh yeah, and that's it. You'll never see a six-string guitar with six nylon. Sometimes the, the big strings are wrapped. They're steel, but they're wrapped around the nylon core. Mm -hmm. Like it'll be a nylon string, and it's wrapped with metal. Mm -hmm. And it just projects more, stays in tune better, and it can handle those frequencies. Yeah. So the lower notes need to kind of project a little more. I think you heard. need more of a medium. That's why the strings are bigger. But if you just had one big piece of nylon, I think it would sound pretty thin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. Moving into the 19th century, um, there's another Spaniard named Francisco Tarrega. Tarrega, yeah. Tarrega. Yeah. Uh, and he transcribed the music of Bach and Mozart for guitar and kicked off the classical guitar and genre. It's, so he, he was a composer in the romantic um, genre. Mm -hmm. So, and what you think of, like, romantic, I don't know, that he's kind of, he's the... And probably the most famous piece is, uh, that he wrote is Recuerdos de, de, uh, de la Alhambra. Huh. Memories of the Alhambra, which is a palace in uh, Granada, I think. And it's just, uh, when you go, it's this amazing. It's from the Moorish culture, so a lot of Arabic. It's just an amazing. Anyway, it's this piece, and all the stuff he did is very virtuosic. Uh, he just put the guitar to another level as mm. far as virtuosity, um, with, but with more modern, more lush harmony. Um, he's kind of set the standard for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Almost kind of bridging into the modern era. Very good, mm -hmm. man. Good guy to know about. Another name you might know from uh, 20th century guitar music is Andres Segovia. Um, he was an instrumental in establishing you know, the guitar as a concert instrument, kind of by showing its technical and expressive qualities. Are you familiar with uh, anything? Yeah, else? that 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 piece I just mentioned, the Recuerdo de la Alhambra. The, my favorite recording of that is his version. Oh, it's probably from the '30s. But he had a way of playing where he would rush the beat and pull back, and it seems it, it, I don't know what the technical term for that is. Yeah, uh, but he was one of the first great concert uh, guitarists. People think he really created almost created class guitar he didn't but he made it popular in the united states from his concerts that he would bring mm -hmm. um so especially in the united states he had a huge influence on guitarists here mm. that made it popular but he was kind of like the um kind of like bb king was the what the m the ambassador of the music of blues around the world he was probably far for many years the ambassador even though there were guitarists just as good arguably, if not better. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say 
there was a couple, but he was just a guitarist. He wasn't a composer, but he did arrange some, is okay. my understanding. Very nice. Very nice. Um, and it sounds like when he was a kid, uh, the guitar was kind of regarded as an instrument of low repute. Oh, like a folk instrument. It was not a, for the concert stage or with orchestras. or. So he was raised on cello and piano and I guess just decided he wanted to rock. Oh, he was a man on the mission. And yeah. uh, like some of the great... Uh, stu older now because he passed away maybe in like late 80s, early 90s. And um, anyway, he really influenced a lot of guitarists with, through his recordings and through his... He would have these guitar workshop master classes that he would have. Mm -hmm. Well, let's fast forward a little bit to the uh, electric guitar. Um, 1931, a man named George Beauchamp, are you familiar with this guy? No. And Paul Barth of the National Guitar Corporation designed the first electric guitar. Henry Watson built it. Uh, Beauchamp and Barth would later team up with Adolf Rickenbacker. Mm. A name many guitarists know. By 1932, they became the first to produce these electric guitars, and it was very popular in the jazz genre. Yes, and those guitars, if you ever look at them, it looks like you take a tin can and mm -hmm. put a neck to it. Yeah. They called it the frying pan or something? The frying pan. And it's just the ugliest looking thing. It looks like something that goes with your car. It's like a <laughs> like you put in the... It doesn't look like a guitar. But, a, you know, it was From the, the idea of using electricity and putting a magnet. And the magnet becomes like a, like a microphone and, and you plug it in. Some, it just seems like out of this world. It's like plugging your harmonica into... I guess they do that too now. You know what I'm saying? It yeah. just seems... The concept seems so strange. But there was a need. They had... There was something called resonator guitars, which was another technology trying to solve the same problem. You think of Dobros. Mm -hmm. Dobros were the Dobro brothers, and they created this little metal spe uh, way of pro projecting sound. Mm -hmm. It was trying to same, solve the same problem. So they had resonator guitars, but they weighed like 40, 50 pounds. Because of but they were loud, is my understanding. Yeah. And if you hear a dobro, it is really loud. So dobro is the same idea. Resonator guitar is like all metal guitar. Mm -hmm. So these guys made that adjustment, and, and instead of using heavy metal, they just said, let's put a metal um, uh, magnetic um, uh, a magnet with electrified to, to pick up the sound and transmit that sound to a speaker, mm -hmm. which could make a lot of sound. Which to me is just so fascinating. You know? It is still pretty cool. <laughs> you know, ever for fun, sometimes if I got an electric guitar and I'm teaching, you know, and no one has, or we're trying to listen to a song, I'll just put my iPhone to my pickup on my guitar. I don't know who showed me this. And it's, it's a microphone. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a microphone. It's the exact same concept. Uh -huh, it's yeah. pretty cool. Interesting. So, but, but yeah, those early guitars are, are, are weird looking things, you mm. know. In 1936, Gibson released its uh, ES-150. Yes. ES for electric Spanish? Yes, that's what ES means. What, 150, do you know where that came from? Yes, is you could get the amp and the guitar for 150 bucks. <laughs> yeah. That's what? the Charlie Christian guitar. Yeah. Who's the, the like, the, the <laughs> I mean, there were other guitarists before, Carl Crest, and some of these guys, people who played with, I can't think of his name, paid with Bing Cosby, I can't think of his name. Uh, uh, oh, I should remember this. But any case, uh, Charlie Christian was the first great guitarist. He's from Oklahoma, I believe. And he could uh, play the guitar like a sax player, like like the great jazz sax players in New York in the in the late 30s. And he played with Benny Goodman, and he died very young, but he just all the recordings he did were amazing. Hmm. And he was kind of like the the visionary. Yeah. But he died at like 28 tuberculosis. That's pretty young. It's pretty young. That's pretty young. If not younger than 28. Yeah. Even for back. Well, yeah. That wasn't too long ago, really. I mean. No. No. <clears throat> Um, one complaint of this particular model, though, was the um, uneven volume amongst the strings. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, if so to... certain guitars, the certain strings on a steel string guitar are different volumes. Like my understanding is, like the B string is louder than the other strings. Something about the tension and the thickness of the string. So a lot of times, you on modern guitars, they they can make it so that they don't pick up that string as much. But on the other ones, the the, the micro the pickups, those little little square things you see on modern electric guitars, or these little uh, anyway, they uh, it's harder to adjust them to just adjust one string. Mm. And that's still a problem today. Let's talk about the log. The log. Are you familiar at all with the log? The log is an experimental guitar that uh, Les Paul. The, the virtuoso guitarist 
Um, he was a, as much of an inventor as he was a guitarist. Mm -hmm. And he would just take that basic idea of that Rickenbacker where you have just the... Well, guitars would feed back because that box, it, when you per, turn up the amplifiers or the speakers, it would pick up... The, the sound coming from the speaker would come back through the guitar because it was close enough, and it would cause this kind of chain reaction, and then it would just cause feedback. It would just Yeah, and it was uncontrollable. So he said, well, if I get rid of the body of the guitar, the box, it'll you can hear more. Well, it's no longer an acoustic guitar because there's if you play an electric guitar not plugged in, it's, it's like a whisper. Mm -hmm. But he put the pickup in, and then later on to make it look aesthetically pleasing he put these other pieces of wood on top and below so it kind of had the shape of a guitar but really modern electric guitars are just this one plank of wood mm -hmm. you know and they then actually with, make them like that now too like, without the yeah no there's different ways they have bolt-on necks now you have uh you use different but it was just wood and then he took two other pieces one on top and on the bottom he, i don't know he glued them together to, to get the shape of a of still of a guitar all aesthetic, <clears throat> all for show. And, right. and he also was one of the first people to do that whole idea of a cutaway. Cutaway, yeah. So instead of that hourglass shape, he where your fingers are when you're getting up and you, you hit the actual body of the guitar, he said, well, let's just cut that away. Yeah. And it's called a cutaway. And that way you can get the higher, the higher notes. Yeah. Very cool, man. It was just a, a funny thing if you, if you Google the picture, Google the log by, <laughs> uh, you know... Les Paul. Les Paul, yeah. <laughs> Most people don't know who Les Paul was. They just think Les Paul was like, I don't know, the owner of Gibson. Uh, but he wasn't. He, you know, he's licensed his name. Uh, and he also was the, f the first person to come up with four-track. Sound on sound. Sound on sound, you know, or a technology. And he would even have it worked into his guitars so he could loop his guitars <laughs> like we use now with the pedal. But he was using tapes built inside his guitars. You're so kidding he, Pretty amazing, yeah. And he had this little the box. He call I think he called it the box, and he could do like four guitar parts, all this little machine working in his Les Paul at, on the fly, and he could do yeah from the log to the box. Yeah. And he also was a master of like using recording techniques, like recording at twice the speed or half the speed, so his guitar sounded twice as high. And he could do all this stuff, yeah. He's a wow. pretty amazing man. Pioneer. He was a pioneer, yeah. Well. Um... That leaves a little bit, I guess the only one we haven't mentioned as far as the main, I guess, guitars everyone knows about is Leo Fender. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, the log we were talking about came out in 1940. Uh, moving forward a little bit ahead, in 1950, Leo Fender came out with a Telecaster, originally called the Broadcaster. That's right. Um, and they were sued by another company because this other company, maybe it was Rickenbacker, or I can't remember, it was Gretsch or anything. They said, we have that name, so the Broadcaster... Which makes a lot more sense to me why they called it that because it's an electric guitar and you're broadcasting. Right. Yeah. 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 And so I guess with the whole space age, they call it this. This. The. Uh, oh, not the broadcast. We're talking about the. Uh, well, the telecast. The telecast was originally the broadcaster yeah. before they had to change yeah. it. I guess right. Yeah. I guess yeah. that and that said a uh, sound telecast is visual like TVs. Uh huh. Oh. And then Stratocaster, maybe the air, you know, they're in space. I don't know. That's the one I was going to ask about. I yeah. still don't know what a strat Stratocaster means. Stratus, like in the sky, you know, yeah. so you think space caster, age. Yeah, Stratus. Yeah. I, I wonder what that Latin word is, Stratus. That's that's a Latin well, word. Oh, the stratosphere. For height, for... The stratosphere. Yeah, so yeah. But so the, the, the uh, prefix would have a Latin etymological root. I don't know. You know, I just, I don't know. I, but when yeah. broadcaster makes more sense than anything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually <laughs> putting something out there. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the Telecaster was actually the first mass-produced solid-body guitar. Uh, four years later is when the Stratocaster came out, which I guess the main difference was it had three pickups and a spring-tension vibrato mm -hmm. and this well-known comfort contour body. Yeah, where you put your right hand, your right arm, normally you play in a guitar, it's an edge, so it kind of digs into your arm. So mm -hmm. I guess they could just bevel that, yeah. so when you play, it doesn't feel like you're wearing, like, digging into your, your forearm all the time. Yeah, imagine. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Design, form, you know, it's pretty cool. <laughs> well, by the 50s and 60s, the guitar made its way into pop music and rock music, and uh, the rest is history as far as electric guitars are concerned. Do you have yes. any favorites that you want to talk about? Your favorite guitar <coughs> favorite players? Favorite guitars? 
Electric guitarist, I guess. Rock oh, guitarist. guitarist? Well, I guess Jimmy Page was like, as a kid, was like my favorite. Just, just, it's not, you know, it just, it was such a, a neat mix of like uh, rock and roll, just rock and roll, like uh, like Elvis kind of rock and roll. And then this new, th and then blues, because he could play a lot of these great blues lines like other guitarists. And then he had the, this heavy metal thing. So it's just that whole mix of styles. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there are people who can, at his best, no, he was hard to top, but mm -hmm. he wouldn't always play at that level. Mm -hmm. But he's just so creative, is what I like about him. Yeah. yeah. So that's just because I was into him so many years. And even now, he's so sloppy, but I still like it. <laughs> just sloppy with the way he plays his right hand, you know. Perfectly sloppy. Yes, it just, but it works, you know. So that was a big one for me growing up. More than Jimi Hendrix, honestly. And I just like, I don't know. Yeah. You can always find someone better. But <laughs> that's what I like, you know. Well, better can be a subjective term. You know, yeah. like the, just the typical guys that you hear about. J -j -j the Jimi Hendrix, J Jimmy, um, Jimmy Page. Page um, Jimmy Herring. No, 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 that's, he was one. I don't think he was born. Maybe he was born back then. I was um, just thinking Jimmy. Um, more just the British blues guys. Uh. I was not into Clapton. the into like um, I got into the fusion thing later, but then I love the 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 jazz guys like the West Montgomerys, uh, the um, hold on, let me think, Kenny Burrell, Barney Kessel is a big one. Hmm. Uh, those guys are older. Jim Hall, jazz guys, so they were recording the '50s and just playing some amazing stuff. So that that guy, I got into that too. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we know you compose music. Yeah. Do you have a composition process? Is the, is there a particular way you like to compose or approach? Uh, sometimes you can start with a harmony, or you like a chord. You know, because I play chords as part of what I do. If I were a drummer, I would probably start with a rhythm, right, or, or a pattern, right. Um, so a lot of times I'll start with a good harmonic part, and then, you know, I'm I I studied some form in college and structures of. But generally, I still think in more of the pop song format mm. when I write something. Sure. Like a main section, there's a bridge, there's a, you know, a breakdown of, you know, just structurally things like right. that. Uh, sometimes I write uh, the melody first, and then I'll keep just tinkering away at the harmony. Sometimes you start with a rhythm. Uh, you have to think, what are you writing for? Are you writing for a jazz band? Are you writing for, like, a, a person on the piano? Mm -hmm. And that affects how you write. You know, oh, it's absolutely. arranging. So, um, so I'll do that. Um, writing in what key? So sometimes I'll take a tune and I'll write, and then, uh, then you just try it in different keys. And something about the key relates on the instrument. But then sometimes I'll write on different instruments. Sure. So I'm using all these starting points. Start on the guitar, or I'll start on an organ, mm. or on a piano. Um, sometimes uh, I like to write. If I write it down, I'll usually write it with pen. Uh, excuse me. I wish I was that good. <laughs> With a pencil on paper, I'm right. not good about writing using a keyboard and the you know and finale and right, and yeah. I'll transcribe things that way, but uh, hmm. so yeah, depending, it just depends, you know. Or you know, if I'm trying something like more open, I'll try to find certain rhythms or certain grooves, certain kind of uh, chord progressions that are great for improv. But if I'm just doing a piece, like a written out piece. Uh, it you just you have to have a spark of something. So sometimes I'll write something and I like I still have little you know you just keep just keep it in a drawer and you <laughs> just you bring it out. Sometimes oh I got this bit here, right. and then how can I work this into a larger piece? So sometimes I'll start from beginning to end. Sometimes I'll write something and write it ten times. I've done some just for it's like a mental challenge. And then from one of those you bring come back later and then oh I like that one. And then you go and perform it, and you say, oh, I need to change it again. So it's always, unless I'm not a person who has a deadline. I don't write for commercials or movies. Right. You know, I've written, when I write tunes, I do them for performances. Mm -hmm. So there's no deadline. I can always rearrange it. And I can write on a deadline. I generally don't. Uh, I, I, I generally like to take my time and, and know that I've, I've done my best work when there's a... Uh, sure. When there's a... When there's a uh, Thing like that. Seems, yeah, it seems like it's hard to put your your creative. It seems like it would kind of kill the creative buzz. Well, you can you can do it. <laughs> people people do it. Yeah. 
you know, I've met people who do jingles and people who do advertising agency jobs, and that is what you're paid to do. Yeah. You know, and arrange people do movies and, and theater. Mm. It's it, the few times I've written on a deadline. It's not so much killing your buzz as making your buzz extremely efficient. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's, it's about, okay. I you know I don't have time to sit here and marinate on this. I, I have to make this decision to move on to the next. Yeah, that's one. true. You yeah. can you can sit and just sometimes you. I, I used to when I was trying this, you know, you you're trying so many things, and sometimes like that tune that I played earlier off that album, it was just it was a good melody. Don't just keep it simple, <laughs> you know. You know, a good idea is a good idea. So if you dress it up with a lot of fancy stuff around it, that's cool. Or you could just play the melody. A good melody is a good melody. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times that's good. Now if you have a great chord progression. You could probably write 20 different melodies. And mm-hmm. that's what improvisation really is, is just composing on the fly. So I, the more I do it, I try to play more simple music instead of this kind of real cerebral kind of stuff. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess um, if, if someone tells me to make a, a, a jingle for a bubblegum commercial, I'm not going to be as married to the... <laughs> to the art of it, I'm just gonna probably bust out something kind of poppy for them, you know? Yeah, bubble gummy. Yeah, happy. You know, sometimes it's just a mood. You just need a mood. Yeah. And say if you're working with somebody, what key can they sing in? Uh, what range? And then you just go, okay. Then you... it's always the parameters. If you set up some parameters, then it's just like learning what when you when your major scale, you're avoiding all the bad sounding notes. Later on, you can learn how to use them. <laughs> Same thing if you set up some parameters, you know, like I'm not gonna play, I'm not gonna have this open-ended thing. It's gotta be a minute and a half long, this song, or this jingle. And then you just write and say, I don't have time for a bridge and no, it's just gotta be get to it. Yeah. You know, ba doop ba here I am for your you know, <laughs> selling, you know, what is it, toothpaste or haze. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know. So yeah. And uh it sounds like you 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 do when you're composing you you are actually sitting there notating. I'll I'll just you know I'll just do it for or now you can just use record it you can record it and then if it's worth writing down sometimes it's fun just to write out stuff mm-hmm. and see what happens from there or uh, just try different voicings or do you know play with the amount of the length of phrases or it just depends yeah i wish i i wish i was that good at it I'm, i mean i've written a few things that i like to listen to but i'm not like putting out stuff weekly uh-huh. and i think recently because unfortunately where we live right now there aren't too many places to play jazz and when you do i think there's an expectation of less of the obscure you know and standards are pretty obscure to most people mm-hmm. already so if you're playing a lot of more avant-garde stuff or mixed meter or weird rhythms or, you know, that kind of stuff, it can turn people off. And you want people to be, to react. You don't want to just turn people off. So I'm not going to be writing something obscure and then never hear it. I want to write something that I want to have played. Right. I want to play something I've heard. Yeah. Is what I was Mm -hmm. trying to say. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So last few little words here. Okay. Any, uh... Any imparting wisdom for aspiring guitarists? Um, I think just you, you it's always got to be about um, keep it where you enjoy it. Um, and if you feel like you're in a rut, if you're once you're learning, because it always happens, you want to get better, or maybe you don't, maybe you just, just enjoy playing it. But even if you're just happy playing the same songs, do something new occasionally or Try to change it up, who you play with, or learning different types of songs. Because I have I keep meeting people who they just like a one-trick pony. They just can only do one thing, and then they get bored and they don't pick it up. Mm. And the reason is they get bored. And right. sometimes if you put yourself in situations just by learning something other than your one favorite band, right. just learn some songs by other bands. Or learn to play some melodies on the guitar. Or people who just do melodies, learn to play some chords and play songs. Yeah, because that's the reverse. People, there's some people who just play songs, and some people who just like to noodle, diddle, 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 <laughs> you know, noodling, as I call it. And uh, and yeah. then they can't play. Okay, play me something. They just go diddle, diddle, diddle. They just they don't they can't play a song. So all, when I teach kids, I always teach them learn to play the song. Then we can do all the noodling stuff. Yeah, stay. Uh, don't get too comfortable in your comfort zone. 
Yeah. Yeah. Sum up. Yeah, I'm just talking for beginners, and you right. know, when you're worrying about getting a gig, you know, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, we that's we all. talk about that a lot. <laughs> that's our cl- one of our closing questions, actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, what is the question? Give us some advice on working with other musicians. That's hard because I'm pretty exacting, and uh, I can be pretty <laughs> annoying to some musicians, but uh, <laughs> because I'm pretty direct, and so it's always a mix of how much, how much is it worth getting in a confrontation if, if over a disagreement like this music should be this way or that way or this is too fast, blah, blah, blah. Um, always be try to be polite to people mm-hmm. because disagreements are going to happen. Um, and if you're polite, that goes a long way. Um, but at some point, if I'm just talking hypothetical, sometimes you have to say, hey, this isn't working, blah, 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 but not make it a personal I don't like you. Yeah thing yeah you, your drum is slow i hate your guts you know this and that happens because because people get so you know if you love playing music Why do you you're, slow down all the time <laughs> no if you slow down you know what's wrong with you as a person you yeah. know uh, sometimes it's it can be frustrating but you have to realize it's music and it's not them as a person unless say they have a drug problem or they're drunk then is them as a person then then it then it is their fault and then but you know yelling at them isn't going to help so that's the first thing try to be prepared when you play with other people just know the song you don't have to have it all for memory but know you can get through it and it makes it fun Mm -hmm. and that helps you keeping a gig be and also wherever you play be polite to the people who work in that establishment if it's a restaurant Mm -hmm. gracious yeah Mm -hmm. just be nice or a church you know uh or Mm -hmm. bar whatever there's very different places same attitude you know (laughs) yeah yeah and and be aware just like don't play too i'm a guitar player and we like to play loud um be aware of your surroundings um know when it's right to play loud know when it's right not to and it's very yeah. subjective because some people will think, oh, it's too loud. And the next person will say, oh, it's fine. Uh, mm-hmm. so I've learned just... some hard lessons in the past it, with the groups I've been in about the difference between how loud we were allowed to play versus how loud we should have been playing. Well, I, I'll tell you a little <laughs> story. Uh, you know, I, I played pretty loud. And then I would notice I'd play with some of these uh, R&B bands, mm. um, which was a newer thing. I guess I didn't tell you that. I played with R&B bands, too. And... Um, and some of these guys play loud, but that's just expected. And you think, mm. but it's because it's keyboards and bass. It's not just the shrill guitar. Mm-hmm. So I would try to keep up with them, and I play, and they all get applause, you know. <laughs> and then I'd play nothing, <laughs> <laughs> and this go on for months. And it's just because I'm, I'm like the, you know, I don't, I just the odd looking guy on stage, and uh, just in the back there. And um, so one day I said, uh, let me just put a mic on my amp you know i was blaring it so i did it and people oh it was great and i realized they just couldn't <laughs> they hear, hear you wow it was an amp that just was very directional uh-huh. so i have to tell people sometimes that you know it's i'm playing loud to where you're sitting but it's not always and it, it's not just it's just that one amp if i had like you have lots of amp in here by the way uh, <laughs> but i only have one amp that i use and so it's just the nature of that amp you know if i have another amp i do have another amp that i have uh, that has Instead of one speaker, it has two speakers, and so it's more open. Yeah. The wide, what would you call this? The more uh, throat or uh, more angle, wider angle mm-hmm. where the sound reaches. Mm-hmm. So it's all subjective when you um, when you play out. I'll play in one bar, I'll play the same volume, different night, same bar, and there'll be a different reaction. Mm. Mm. So. So when you're same thing when you're listening to people, same drummer of suits drummers. They can be bass players. <laughs> yeah. They can be playing and they'll just so you have to try to be keep to keep yourself in check, you know. Yeah. Oh, speaking of keeping in check, what about that ego? <laughs> How do you keep the ego in check? Uh just remind yourself. Just remind yourself, what am I what are we doing? This is not this is not we're not selling foreclosing on a house here. <laughs> Uh, we're just this is music nobody's but life been, is on the line I, I've been on both ideally. sides I've been on both sides of it. I've given it and I've taken it and uh, <laughs> usually doesn't happen mm-hmm. usually but it does when it happens it happens but you know I yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so I try not to be in the situation sometimes it's better just if you see see that situation happening just don't be in that situation mm-hmm. like if you find yourself getting a situation with certain people where it gets kind of a uh, back and forth 
then is it worth being in that situation? So yeah. I, I've left, like, whether it's a church gig or a band, or sometimes it's not worth it. So I've walked away from things just because, no, with no arguments or anything, because it's stressful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It shouldn't be stressful. No, it's no. stressful enough just playing the music. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be that's stressful right. to deal, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> We're supposed to enjoy this. <laughs> yeah, there there are more profitable professions in the world if you if it's not fun. That's right? exactly right. <laughs> you know, we're not doing it for the money. Right. Well, I, I we are, no. but but well, not, I mean, we are, but yeah, we would be ish. in a different pre- uh, profession if we were, <laughs> mm-hmm. if we were just yeah. for money. Period. So, last thing, how can people get to your music? I have a website called uh, Carlos Pino. So my last name is spelled P I N O. Awesome. So Carlos Pino Music, and we will link to that. We'll link to that on our website. Yeah. Absolutely. And just put my name in YouTube. Put Carlos Pino Guitar, and there is actually another guitarist. There's a several with my name. Uh, there's a guy in Spain. There's a guy, another guy in Colombia. There's a guy on the West Coast. Um, but um, I'm I don't know. I don't know. You know. But if you look to my website, that we have links to. Um, YouTube videos, so you'll know it's the Carlos that I who's talking right now. <laughs> awesome, the Carlos yeah. we're hearing, and that was Carlos Pino Music dot com. You yeah. said, and can we can people buy your CDs or do you have anything? To <coughs> if they contact me, uh, I'll be fine to sell. I have two different CDs. I'd like to start working on one soon. I want to do an album of uh, just solo guitar and some duets, and I like doing like I was talking about more new age type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, but yes, they can contact me if they're interested in getting purchasing either of those CDs. That'd be great. So if they want to contact you, they can email you from the website. Yes, your website. Yes, there's a link uh, where they can fill out some information, whether it be for lessons or for recordings. Hmm. Um, and uh, I'll get back in touch with them. Mm-hmm. Well, Carlos, this has been fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, okay, th- I talked your heads off. But, uh, <laughs> that's, okay. that's a lot of talking. <laughs> that's what a podcast is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just talk yeah, people. Okay, I was happy to do it. Thanks, guys. And uh, we really appreciate you bringing your guitar also and playing some examples. That was really, really nice. Very pretty guitar. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, great. the Bulgarian guitar. Yes. Okay, so we're going to take us out with uh, another one of your originals. What's this one called? This is one I did uh, off a record, the same one as the piece that you heard at the beginning of the the podcast, Uh, and it's called December, and it's uh, another open-ended, it's almost like a soundtrack type of sounding piece, Hmm. but I hope you like it. Perfect for bumper music, right? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) All right, we'll see you guys again. Thanks again for listening. What instrument are we going to cover next? You'll just have to keep on listening. If you have questions or comments for us, send them to info at musicstudent101.com. Carlos and hear his music at carlospinomusic.com.